I've, I've twice attempted a citizen's arrest of President Robert Mugabe. Uh, the first was in London in 1999, and the second time was in Brussels in 2001. And I'll perhaps tell you about the, um, the occasion in 1999. Um, it, it was the result of a late night phone call on a Thursday night, around about midnight, I picked up the phone, and this guy in an African sounding accent said, um, you may be interested to know that President Mugabe has just arrived in London from Paris. He's here on a private shopping trip. He's staying at St. James's Court Hotel in Belgravia, and he'll be flying back to Zimbabwe from Heathrow Airport at 6 p.m. on Saturday night. Before I could ask any question, before I could ask any question, the phone went dead. So I thought to myself, is this a hoax, a joke? I decided to assume it might be true. And so the next morning, I hastened to Amnesty International's offices to get a dossier on human rights abuses by the Mugabe regime. And in particular, a affidavit and documentation about the torture of two black journalists, Ray Choto and Mark Chavanduka, who had been tortured on Mugabe's personal orders, and he had later publicly boasted about it. So I decided to try to do a citizen's arrest to have Mugabe put on trial in Britain under our anti-torture laws, which incorporate the United Nations Convention Against Torture into British domestic law. The next thing I tried to do was to find people who could help me do this. I rang around and around and around, and I've never heard so many plausible excuses. <laughs> um, but eventually, of all the different organisations, the only people I could find, certain and committed, were three members of the LGBTI group Outrage, which I was involved with at the time, um, who were willing to join me, and we decided to try and make the arrest on the Saturday morning. Given that he had to fly back to uh, Zimbabwe that evening, at some point he had to leave the hotel. So uh, we assembled at about 8.30 in the morning uh, outside the St. James Court Hotel, still not knowing for certain whether he was actually there or whether this was a whole hoax. Um, we brought along a, a, a journalist, a photographer and a video person to record whatever might happen. Now, if it's a freezing cold morning, which was, wasn't very nice, and no, I don't think, don't think any of us actually had breakfast, so we were quite shivery. We were hanging around in the freezing cold, trying to look inconspicuous. <laughs> um, we stood on the other side of the road and slightly up the street. One was staying at a bus stop, the other one was in a telephone booth, the other one reading a newspaper, and I was looking in shop windows, trying to look inconspicuous. But hey, after a couple of hours, you know, it's difficult to remain you know, unnoticed. And sure enough, we observed that the um, concierge guy, the guy with the top hat and tails who stands outside posh hotels, came out on the steps and started looking very intently at each of us. He'd obviously noticed that we'd been there. And they disappeared. And of course, in this circumstance, when you're trying to do something like this, he's a head of state. What we were trying to do was, his bodyguards, if he was there, probably were armed. You know, we were nervous, really nervous, and when you're really nervous, your stomach is churning over, your body temperature plummets. I, I was shivering, um, you have the urgency to defecate and urinate, uh, you've got a splitting headache, and of course, just at this moment, I really had this urge to pee, because I knew if I go away to a toilet uh, to relieve myself, that will surely be the moment he comes out. <laughs> so, very fortunately, I had a copy of the Evening Standard with me, which I rolled up into a cone-like shape, <laughs> and stood in a shop doorway and gently and discreetly peed into it. Um, within five minutes, from the side entrance, the vehicle entrance, out came five or six African-looking guys who were looking and pointing in our direction. And that was the first inkling we had Yes, he probably is in the hotel. We assumed that these were his bodyguards, the security team who'd been alerted by the concierge to go and check us out. So I thought, if they think for one moment that we are a threat, they will call the police. 
given my history, as soon as the police see me, they'll know something's up. So we've got to do something quickly. And of course, it's really difficult in those circumstances to think on your feet when you're cold, shivering, got a headache, your stomach's churning over. Um, but suddenly, amazingly, I had a brainwave. I just walked across the road straight to these guys, smiling and beaming, and said, Hi guys, I'm from the News of the World, and these are my photographer and other fellow reporters. We're here because we know that Elton John is in the hotel with his new boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to get the story for tomorrow's paper. They looked and shook their heads in disbelief. I said, I'll give you 50 pounds if you tell us which room he's in. I think I only had 10 pounds in my pocket. Um, they all started talking in local dialect, showing on ever dearly. Uh, I'll give you 75 pounds. I'll give you 100 pounds. <coughs> Still, they obviously were not buying it. So then I, said to them, I turned to one of them and said, I know you. You are part of Elton John's security team because I saw you at the Wembley concert two months ago. If Elton John wasn't in the hotel, you wouldn't be here. You can't deny it. You are part of Elton's team. <laughs> and they spoke some more, all started bursting out laughing. And then they walked away. And I walked away and I thought, I think I might have convinced them. Sure enough, about 10 minutes later, out came President Mugabe in his limousine. I scratched the top of my head to indicate that he was in the car. And my colleagues ran straight out in front of the speeding limousine, forcing it to halt about six inches from their legs. Then one of them ran behind the car so it couldn't move forward and couldn't move backward. I ran from the side and opened the rear door. Astonishingly, it was unlocked. <laughs> and there before me in the back seat was President Robert Gabriel Mugabe. I gently took his arm with this hand, then held out this hand to show I didn't have a weapon and say, President Mugabe, you're under arrest on charges of torture. Torture is a crime under international law. I am now summonsing the police. You should have seen the look on his face. <laughs> he is very dark skinned, but a visible ashen pallor. <laughs> he recoiled back in the back seat and held his hands. His jaw dropped, his eyes popped. He looked like a frightened 10 year old kid. And I thought to myself, now you know what your victims feel like, only we aren't going to kill you, we're going to take you to a court of law, and you'll have a chance to defend yourself. So we summoned the police, the police arrived, only three officers initially, there were four of us. It took two of them to remove us. I mean, you know, we told them what we were doing, they were, they were gobsmacked when we told them who was in the car. <laughs> We told them we had the affidavits from the torture victims. We told them about the Section 134 of the Criminal Justice Act 1988, which allows for the prosecution of any torturer or person who's acquiesced in torture anywhere in the world to be tried in Britain. They weren't interested. They just knocked the papers out of our hands. Um, so each time they tried to drag one of us away, they took us over to the pavement, put us down. They went back to get the next person. So the person who was on the pavement then <laughs> ran back in front of the car. So I had to wait for reinforcements. About 20 officers arrived in a number of vans, and then we were very violently and forcibly removed. We were taken to Belgravia Police Station, where we were threatened with a whole host of charges, behaviour like to cause a breach of the peace, obstructing the highway, criminal damage, assaulting a police officer, and even riot and affray, which is a very, very serious charge. All of which were completely untrue. And thankfully, we had the video crew there to record it all to show the police were lying. Anyway, we were eventually bailed after about nearly seven hours' detention um, to appear in court at a later date. Meanwhile, President Mugabe, of course, was given a police escort to go Christmas shopping at Harrods. <laughs> um, when we appeared in court on the opening day, the prosecution dropped all charges. I can only speculate. My speculation is they didn't want it tested in a court of law that we had acted lawfully, that we had used the lawful power of citizen's arrest to apprehend someone who stood accused with good evidence of condoning a criminal act, namely torture. So they didn't want that precedent established in court, so the charges were all dropped. Uh, we didn't succeed, but I've got to say that in the 
weeks and months afterwards, I personally received over 5,000 emails from people inside Zimbabwe, all saying almost exactly the same thing. Thank heavens someone listens, knows and cares about what's happening in our country. We thought no one cared. So psychologically and emotionally, I think it was a big boost for people in Zimbabwe who felt the world had forgotten them. Um, I only wish we'd succeeded, and if we had, perhaps Zimbabwe would have not suffered the terror campaign which began a few years later.